Hey guys, today I'm going to be doing a tribute to one of our veterans of the United States Army. Now, I've done tributes before, and actually these are among my favorite videos. If you go to our playlist and if you look at the tribute uh, to the vets, uh, there are some great veteran stories there. Some of them are ones that I uncovered after I picked up a gun and maybe found the name inside and I did some research. In this case, it was one of our subscribers, David Beck who contacted me after he had seen one of our videos and said, hey, one of my closest friends, John Halata, was one of our great American heroes, and I would love it if you would tell his story. So um, the story of John Halata, uh, there's a lot of information in here. Um, actually, David Beck put this together, and this is just a, uh, a, a notebook just full of information about the life of John Halata and the gun that he brought back from an SS officer. This Luger came back from an SS officer. So I'm gonna tell you that story. So grab a drink, sit back and relax because this is gonna be an inspirational story. So John Halata grew up in Palmerton, Pennsylvania. Now I'm in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, actually Western suburbs. And if I go up to Allentown, just above Allentown, Allentown's about an hour north of here. So it's a very small town just north of Allentown. It's also steel mill country. He worked for Bethlehem Steel when the uh, war broke out and he got a deferment because he worked in the ordnance department of Bethlehem Steel. So even though he had a deferment, he tried to enlist in the Army Air Corps, uh, but he was rejected because it turned out he was colorblind. And then uh, he tried for the paratroopers, but he's actually too tall. He was six foot three and over 200 pounds. So he was a, a, a big guy. Um, and so he was turned down for paratroopers and Army Air Corps. But in November of 1943, he enlisted into the United States Army at the age of 23. Now, a couple interesting things about his enlistment. First of all, he was fluent in German. If you know that area of the country, actually Lancaster, PA, all the way up to Allentown, uh, there's a lot of Pennsylvania Dutch. It is uh, Pennsylvania Dutch country, and he was not necessarily Pennsylvania Dutch, but he grew up with people who spoke German. It is a dialect, uh, but from people who speak it, uh, they tell me that it, it's pretty close to actual German. So he understood German, and he was a big guy, uh, and so therefore he was chosen to carry the BAR. That makes sense. Uh, if you've ever picked up a BAR, that would be tough to carry around, but he became a BAR man. And also that part of the country, he grew up hunting. So he already was a really good shot. In basic training, he, he got the reputation of a really tough guy. It reminds me of the guy in Band of Brothers. They called him Bull. He was like the big guy of the unit. And as this story goes along, um, it, I get a visual image. When I think of John Halata, I get a visual image of Bull. Uh, here's an actual picture of him. He wasn't uh, uh, big as in heavy. Uh, but he was a tall guy and, again, over 200 pounds uh, carrying a BAR. But we're going to see some similarities with Bull as we go along. Bull's real name, by the way, was Denver Randleman. And you see a picture of him here, a uh, big guy in his unit. And uh, his story is told in the Band of Brothers. And he passed away not too long ago as well. But let's move along with John's story. Um, after being in basic training for six months, uh, he was sent to England right before D-Day, actually April of 1944. He was uh, sent over to England in order to get ready for the invasion of France. I think the best thing to do at this point is actually read his story in his own words. So the, he is dictating um, these stories to us, which I'm going to read to you, uh, through his friend David Beck, who put together uh, this notebook of information. So let me read this in his words. On my departure for England for the Normandy coast, I was amazed by the unbelievable number of ships and barrage balloons who dotted the horizon. When we arrived off of Normandy, I had to go over the side of the ship and seemingly down an endless cargo net into a bouncing landing craft carrying my rifle and a full pack. It was a daunting task, but nothing compared to what I was about to face. Although D-Day had been a week earlier, the effects of the Battle of Omaha and Utah beaches were evident in the channel and on the land. There were wrecked vehicles and shrewd equipment. Wounded and dead were ever present. On June 16th, we move out to attack an entrenched German garrison in Cherbourg. After 10 days of heavy fighting, and the bastion fell to the men of the 79th Division. I've, I've neglected to mention he was in the 79th Infantry Division. This is his, uh, the patch that he wore on his uh, shoulder. 
Um, so again, 79th Infantry Division, which is actually a, a storied division uh, and got uh, numerous citations. This is our first real battle and we took uh, many casualties. On July 3rd, we began an attack on a small French town. This area was very stubbornly defended by the Germans and once again, many casualties were taken on both sides. House to house combat was the norm on July 7th and 8th. One of the first and most unforgettable experience was hearing a seriously wounded German soldiers lying between the hedge groves calling out for help. One of our boys uh, shot him in order to shut him up. I got into a big argument with him after that. And a few days later, he was seriously wounded. After witnessing such death and destruction, I asked a French farm lady to fill my canteen with brandy in place of the water. This is a practice that I com continued throughout most of my combat experience. Uh, now this section is called the hedge groves. For the next several weeks, we made little progress against the German positions anchored at Saint Lo. The hedge groves proved to be a natural barrier and they were much more advantageous for the defender as opposed to the attacker. We lost a lot of men and armor trying to gain precious yards. There was also minefields. On one occasion, I was one third of the way across an open area and then boom, 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 Delayed mines started going off. My lieutenant, just five yards from me, stepped on a bouncing Betty, which fatally injured him. Somehow I ran back through the field to get help without stepping on another mine. We had to leave our guys there until the field could be swept. I had three out of my four lieutenants killed in the first two months of Normandy. On another occasion, I had just dug a foxhole when the Germans opened up on us with their 88s. I raced back to my shelter only to find two other people had already jumped into it. So I piled on top and laid as flat as I could and then voom. I felt heat and pressure across my backside. A piece of shrapnel had torn my rear seat out of my pants. I was almost killed that day, but I had good fortune that day. After the breakthrough at San Lo, we headed toward the Seine River. At this time, we were part of Patton's third army and we were protecting his flank. Our orders were to not shoot down any aircraft because this would give away our position, but also we were much more likely to be shooting at Allied planes than German planes. My squad and I were walking across an area parallel to our vehicles along the road when I saw a fighter coming down after the tanks and the trucks. As he started strafing, I raised my BAR I led the guy, opened up on, uh, with my armor-piercing ammunition. Much to my surprise, the plane began to smoke and appeared to crash over the hill. Everyone was either congratulating me or yelling at me for shooting at the plane when this command jeep comes driving up over the field. Some general with stars on his helmet got out and yelled, who shot that plane? Well, everybody began to back away, and I'm standing there all alone with a smoking BAR and 50 brass casings around my feet. So I had no choice, and I said, I did it, sir. With that, he said, good shooting, soldier. You got that German son of a bitch. <laughs> he then had a fellow officer write down my name, but I never heard anything back. Later, I found out that that was old blood and guts himself, Patton. What guts he had for a general to be up in the very front line. I thought it was great, but his persistent aggressiveness eventually led to my capture. All right, this section is called lobbing a grenade. Another training dis directive that we had besides not shooting down aircraft was to lob a grenade, don't throw it. I was never in the military, so I, I don't understand that. I guess if you lob it, you have enough time for the, um, for the fuse. Uh, but he said, you're supposed to lob it, not throw it. We were moving through a French cemetery on the outskirts of the town uh, when a German MG42 machine gun opened fire from a position on the third floor window of a house across the street. With some difficulty, I managed to get over the wall across the street and position myself directly underneath the window where the German machine gun position was. I pulled the pin on my grenade and lobbed it toward the window. It hit the wall and bounced down and landed at my feet. I quickly grabbed it again, ran out into the street and threw a bullseye right up to the window. The grenade went off and killed all three German gunners. Uh, this section is called Captured. My unit crossed the Seine River about 40 miles northwest of Paris on August 20th. Myself, along with a veteran army ranger, occupied a far forward position. 
We were given orders to withdraw, but instead we stayed in order to hold the ground. He said, I do not want to take the same real estate twice. On the night of August 25th, the Germans, led by King Tiger tanks, counterattacked. Our position was overrun, and the lieutenant and I hid under a road culvert. About 10 a.m. the next morning, the Germans ordered us to get out or they would throw a grenade. The decision was relatively easy. Now, this, uh, what strikes me about this is if you have a guy with a BAR in a culvert, um, the fact that they gave him a chance to surrender is uh, kudos to that soldier. Um, probably saved his life that day. But also there's similarities. I, I remember I talked about Bull uh, in Band of Brothers. I think that in episode three, there is a scene where he um, is in a far forward position. His unit withdraws and he is uh, left there by himself and hides in a culvert overnight. Um, he gets back to his unit the next morning. But in this case, John Halata is uh, captured by the Germans. As a prisoner, I was held initially in a front area. There we encountered what the Germans call American automatic artillery. This is a continuous scream followed by boom, 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 almost like a machine gun, but it's dozens and dozens of artillery tubes all firing in tandem. We had much more firepower, but the Germans had the 88, which was very uh, accurate and deadly. While near the front, I witnessed an American fighter get shot down. All the Germans opened up fire on him with everything they had. The pilot did not bail out, but instead rammed his plane into a German depot. He was a real hero. I felt badly being a prisoner and there was because there was nothing I could do, nothing I could do to help. But the German front lines turned out to be a very dangerous place and I was anxious to get out of there. Uh, this next paragraph is uh, kudos to the French. I know we have French uh, viewers, but uh, this is uh, typical of how the French treated the Americans. Uh, he says, not long after my capture, I was united with another Company A uh, fellow Pennsylvanian from Kutztown. We know where that is as well. We were moving by truck through France and Chalfont. On our way, a brave French woman defied the Germans and passed us loaves of bread and water. From there, we were taken to Salak 7 in Luxembourg, where we were allowed to shower our flea-infested bodies. On September 4th, we were put on rail cars for a train ride to Mooseburg, which is in uh, Bavaria. This trip was far from uneventful, as U.S. fighters strafed our train. Stalak 7A is the next section. Stalak 7A was located in the Bavarian town of Mooseburg, about 35 uh, miles northeast of Munich. When I arrived there, it was just for enlisted men like myself. But there were four sections, one for the Russians, which was kept separate from the rest of us, and then one uh, for all of the Americans, English, and French. We were free to intermingle, except for the Russians. Not sure why that was, but uh, kudos to the Russians. I think they got uh, treated more harshly than anyone else. Uh, we had barbed wire fence surrounding the camp. We slept and ate in wooden barracks. I had a prison ID tag. The tag was perforated so that it could be broken in two. One half was to be buried with you and the other half given to the Red Cross. As the war continued, the Stalag became even more crowded and conditions worsened. We were quite depressed, especially when so many Americans were added after the Battle of the Bulge in December of 44. We knew, however, that things must be going in our favor because we could watch daily bombings endless waves of, of American and British bombers flying overhead. It was at this time that I saw my first jet airplane. I believe it was an ME-262. Flying around seemed to hearten the Germans, thinking that they had a new secret weapon. Food had become very scarce, and the Red Cross weekly packages were inadequate. I went from 215 pounds down to 165 during my captivity in the Stalag. Meals were an interesting cultural event. I, I love this part, so shout out, to the, <laughs> shout out to the French, to the British, the Americans. Uh, so listen to the chow line. The American GIs would push and shove in line and gobble down all their soup and bread. The Brits would be very proper. First they would have tea, and then they would call to the Germans to please have their food placed upon the table while they finished their tea. <laughs> they would then line up and march to the chow line. The French would periodically decorate the mess tins with dandelions and other flowers to have a more elegant dining experience. I loved the Brits for their dry sense of humor. In the latrines, they, they hung a sign that says, 
Please do not throw your butts into the urinals. It renders them almost unsmokable. Many of those guys had been there since Dunkirk in 1940. This section is called the guards. Overall, our treatment was fair. There were good guards and bad guards, just like there would be in any internment. One day we were sent by train into Munich to help clean up the city after it had been bombed. One Brit who was suffering from pneumonia and in very bad shape was being harassed to work harder by one of the guards. I decided to intervene. I stepped between the guard and the sick man who was being bullied. I cussed at him in German and yelled at him to leave the poor sick man alone and comply with the Geneva Convention. He then smashed me in the mouth with the butt of his rifle, chipped off the front of my tooth. After that, however, he left the infirmed alone. I looked for him briefly at the end of the war in order to repay him for his hostility, but I never did locate him. On another occasion, I threatened to kill one of our own guys who was stealing food from frail soldiers in the barracks. One of the sick guys, Bill, came to my hometown after the war to thank me for saving his life. I barely recognized him as I only remembered him as Bill and his emaciated body in the Stalag. Um, now he goes on to uh, a work farm. In the spring of 1945, so things are almost done now, uh, we had the opportunity to get out of the Stalag and go into the German farmlands in order to help out in the fields. When they asked me what was my occupation before the war, I told them that I was a farmer and I raised pineapples. If you don't live in the United States, you don't raise pineapples in Pennsylvania. While they didn't have any pineapple farms, my roost worked and I was sent to be part of a work detachment assigned to the local farm. This enabled me to get some additional food. On one of the farms that I worked, it was owned by an old farmer and his wife. The farmer hated Americans, but his wife was kind and very helpful. On one occasion, she could see that I was sick and she gave me some hot tea and schnapps. A guard saw this and admonished her. She then took a broom and hit him with it and ordered him to leave the house. Each night we would return to a, f a central farmhouse where we were locked up for the evening. Uh, now this section is called my escape. Without maps or a compass, it was hard to plan an escape. I was also in my P POW uniform with painted large triangles so that everybody would recognize I was a prisoner. I also only had wooden shoes. When I heard the distant artillery, I knew which direction to go, and I made my plans to escape from the farm before returning to the Stalag. Late in the day, I picked up a scythe so that I would look like a prisoner of war that was a farm worker, and I headed northwest toward the sound of the artillery. I traveled mostly at night. Finally, I noticed a column of American vehicles and infantry approaching. I slowly walked out and explained that I was a prisoner of war. They were members of the 20th Armored Division, new to combat, and very wary of potential German officers impersonating as civilians trying to escape. They asked me, Sprechen Sie Deutsch? So I answered them in German. I immediately became suspect. I was then passed to a doctor who asked me multiple questions. He asked me about baseball, which I didn't really follow. He also asked me about Frank Sinatra, which I knew very little about. So things were not going well. After a day or two, however, they finally believed that I probably was an American and they gave me a new uniform, some chow, but they would not give me a weapon because they were not 100% convinced that I wasn't a German spy. It was now late April and the Germans were surrendering in droves. One group of old Volkssturm, those are the, the, last, the last ditch troops uh, of old men and, and young boys, accompanied by an SS officer approached. Uh, we told them to lay down their weapons on the side of the road um, I was then directed by my superior officer to interrogate the German officer. The German officer demanded that I salute him and said he would only surrender to somebody of his rank or higher. With that, I walked to the side of the road, picked up this holstered Luger. I took it out, cocked it, and walked up to him. I then asked him for more information, and he immediately responded. With this act, the Americans now believed that I was legit <laughs> and truly an American. They got a chuckle out of how the SS man had been humbled. I kept the Luger, and he gives a serial number, as personal protection because I was not issued a, another handgun. So I kept this for personal protection, not really as a souvenir. But still, I brought it home at the end of the war, and I kept this gun for over 60 years. Uh, this next section is uh, called the trip home. We shipped out of Le Havre uh, in mid-May on one of the Liberty ships. Um, going home was not without incident. 
as we had to zigzag and that took a really long time and evidently a couple ships collided. Um, I guess because uh, the Japanese were still in the area. Um, fortunately, after I got back to the States, uh, soon thereafter the Japanese surrendered in August, I had real serious doubts about my willingness to continue the fight. Uh, John later went on to receive uh, several citations uh, from both the French and the U.S. government. Uh, he also got a bronze star uh, for bravery and uh, several other commendations. Uh, let's take a look at the Luger, though, uh, and then we'll come back and wrap up his life. All right, so let's jump to the part that many of you are waiting for. I, I hope you enjoy the stories as much as I do. I, I think that um, every vet that served uh, in any capacity should be able to dictate their stories and get them down. I know my dad has written out a diary. He never, he never uh, fought in actual combat, but he did serve in World War II uh, as a pharmacist mate and did a lot of work with uh, burned and wounded Navy personnel. Um, but uh, certainly my hats go off to all of those who served. I, I, as I read the stories, um, some of them humorous and some of them I can't even imagine. Um, but some of you really just wanted to hear about this gun. I just think it's remarkable. This is not for sale. Uh, this is going back to David Beck, who was his close friend and the one who dictated all of this. But let me walk you through this. Now, um, I've said before, whenever I say this was taken from an SS officer, we all roll our eyes because everybody, nobody took it from a cook or a clerk. It's always an SS officer. Uh, this story is so detailed that uh, we have to believe that it was taken from an SS officer. This one happened to be alive. As you know, I did a video about a gun taken from Buchenwald, a dead SS officer. Um, so let's just go through and I will tell you why I, I believe this was issued to the SS. Uh, first of all, uh, we can see the holster here, and it is Waffen-proofed on the back. Uh, it does say P08. And right here, you can see maker initials and very faint uh, 41. So this was uh, made in 1941, and this uh, was with the gun, because he says in the story that it was a holstered uh, Luger. Uh, there is a tool. It's unmarked. Uh, we'll set that aside. And let's pull out this Luger. Now, uh, interesting Luger. Uh, it is DWM mark, so uh, 41 uh, holster, but DWM is World War I or um, soon thereafter. Uh, there's no chamber date, which tells me this was a commercial gun. And as we look at the left-hand side, you see the crown end proof. So this is a commercial gun from the 1920s. It was therefore most likely, I would bet my house, that this was originally 30 caliber because the commercial guns uh, were generally 30 caliber. Um, you can see the serial number and it's all matching numbers, but there's a couple of, there's several discrepancies about this gun. Uh, one, if we look at the bottom of the side plate, um, you can see a serial number on the bottom. And that's how they numbered uh, commercial guns in the 1920s. And then it is externally numbered, which is how they numbered military guns in World War I and World War II. So we have a commercial gun uh, that was ra later uh, reworked um, for the German military. If you look at the barrel, you can, see the, you can clearly see the difference in color. One is a high polished color and the, uh, the DWM uh, receiver frame is more of a duller finish. It does have a matching mag, by the way, uh, but that number looks renumbered. So again, reworked. It is a Mauser um, magazine. You can see the 42 code. So made by Mauser, matching. So it was uh, reworked by an arsenal. Um, and so if we look at the right-hand side, you see the SU-25 proof. That is Spandau um, Arsenal number 25. That's where this gun was reworked. If we take a close look at the barrel, again, now this is 9 millimeter. I, I'm, my conjecture is this is replaced. It originally had a 30 caliber. Now it's in 9 millimeter. You will see the Eagle 623, uh, which means it, the barrel was made in the Steyr factory. Um, the, most of the rest of the gun was made by DWM. Uh, the magazine is made by Mauser, and this was all put together in the Spandau Building 25 of the uh, military arsenal. Now, so basically a reworked gun. A lot of people would say, well, reworked guns are end of war. 
Uh, that's probably the case, but there were also a lot of reworked guns uh, earlier in the war, and, and here's, here's why they went to the SS. Now, remember, the German army was defeated in World War I, and they were not allowed to get any more arms. In fact, the arms that were issued, the millions of Lugers, not millions, a million Lugers were ordered either destroyed or reworked or sold, uh, but they had to get rid of them. They only were allowed to have 100,000 soldiers in their army, and therefore they only had arms for 100,000 soldiers. No guns were being made. Now, Hitler comes to power in 1933. By 1934, he's beginning to order more weapons. So who's first in line to get weapons? Of course, the, uh, the German army, a very proud institution, was first in line to order guns, and they ordered as many as they could. In fact, you can just hear them. They were, they were told they're not allowed to have any ammo, any weapons. You know, imagine just cutting off the military completely. And they're begging for stuff, and they can't get it. So now Hitler, they call up and say, hey, can we get some arms? He says, sure. How many do you want? Well, I'll take a million. So they call up and they want as many guns as they possibly can. So they have existing contracts starting in 1934. They're contracted to get every gun that comes off the assembly line from the Mauser factory, from the Walder factory. Um, they're getting all the guns. The SS comes along. And remember, now the SS in the beginning was a security force. But then later, and we did a video on Gottlob Berger, Gottlob Berger started the Waffen SS. And these were to be elite troops. Now, the problem is they're not in line. They have no orders in, and so they have to get at the back of the line. They're not getting guns. Even though they're elite troops, they're not getting elite guns. So what we find is the K-98s are generally, uh, the K-98s that went to the Waffen-SS, um, they were reworked uh, from World War I, uh, so they're leftover guns that are reworked. And the sidearms they got many times were leftover from World War I, reworked at Spandau, by the way, they also did the K-98s, reworked and issued to the Waffen-SS. So the story does drive that this would have gone to the SS. Now we also, from photographs, we see that the SS um, also carried radums and high powers and other guns from the captured countries because logic would dictate that the German army had no military orders uh, for the production of uh, CZ-27s, uh, Polish pistols or Belgian pistols, of course, uh, they had not taken those countries yet, so there are no orders in. So the Waffen-SS were able to jump the line a little bit uh, to get some of the weapons that were made by the occupied countries. So the story does drive this, this very easily could have been um, issued to an SS officer who found himself at the end of the war having almost no men left. Uh, being assigned to a Volkssturm of old men and young boys. Um, and that's how uh, John Halada uh, came in possession of this gun. And again, he kept it for 60 years. There is a spare magazine. Um, the, the magazine in the gun does match. This spare magazine is also a Mauser-made magazine. But you'll notice that the, the magazine in the gun is blued. So this has got to be about 1936 or later. Uh, whereas this one is nickeled, which is probably 1934, 1935, um, because that's, that's when they used the nickeled mag. So these came from two different eras. Uh, they both were renumbered. You can see on the spare mag that that was ground down and renumbered. So again, uh, this was uh, reworked in the Spandau uh, armory. All right, let's jump back to John Halada. Uh, I do have pictures of him later in his life, along with pictures of his family. Uh, he came back uh, to the United States because of the GI Bill. He was able to attend Penn State University, where he majored in industrial engineering. After graduation, uh, uh, he would have been an interesting man for me to meet. He worked as a consultant, and his specialty was to turn around uh, companies that were in trouble. A lot of the work that he did was in the Pittsburgh area. We know that the steel mills and a lot of the companies, if you know the history of Pittsburgh, it used to be known for uh, pollution and dirt and smog. Uh, now it's a uh, high tech, a beautiful city, uh, and you can breathe the air. It's a beautiful place. Um, and part of that was retooling uh, the old factories into modern, more efficient factories. And that's what uh, John did. 
He uh, specialized in restructuring companies. Uh, today, we, he would probably work for a private equity firm where they would buy companies, turn them around, and sell them off at a huge profit. That's very interesting to me. I, I find that fascinating. I know people in that industry, and I could spend hours talking to them about what they do. So I would imagine uh, uh, John and I would have a great conversation about the work that he did. John got married and had two children, uh, but unfortunately, his wife died when the kids were still young. So with the help of his mother-in-law, he, he raised his kids. He also was very interested in artwork. Um, just amazing to me, but it's kind of a Renaissance man. So here's this tough guy who carried a BAR in the war, um, speaking German, uh, but he also was an artist. Uh, he loved to paint and he had a room in his house that was his art and uh, painting studio. He also played golf. It says here he has a four handicap. That means absolutely nothing to me. Randy, do you know what a four handicap, is that good? He has a four handicap? Okay, Randy's shaking his head. We don't know, but you will comment. He had a four handicap, which I guess is pretty good. And the other reason I would like him, it says here he was obsessed with the stock market. He would have the ticker on all day long. And guess what? If you come to Legacy Collectibles and you come to our uh, living room, you will see that ticker on all day long. It's on mute, so we just kind of watch it go by. Uh, maybe it's because we're all ADD and it's just, we like a lot of action. But that was John. He had the stock market on all the time. And according to Dave, he was actually very good at it. He would buy and sell and made quite a bit of money on the stock market. So obviously, he was a really smart guy. I may have already mentioned it, but I wanted to reiterate that there, there is a picture of him receiving a, a, a word from the French government. There was also unit citations from Congress. He got the Brown Star for bravery, but he did not get a Purple Heart, which I think he should have. I think uh, getting hit in the jaw uh, by the guard, he was clearly wounded and should have gotten a uh, Purple Heart, which takes me back to Bull. Uh, remember Den Denver Randleman? Uh, he also... Um, received a Bronze Star and a Purple Heart uh, during his service. So that's why I, I found the two of them uh, very similar and I kind of get a feeling of similar pa personality for those two guys. One other thing I wanted to mention, later in his life he had severe hearing loss, probably from shooting the BAR with no ear protection, you can imagine, and all the uh, grenades and artillery being bombed and all that. He had severe hearing loss. Also he had a uh, Dave said his jaw ached um, through most of his life because of being hit in the mouth and chipping a tooth, uh, but he had constant jaw problems for the rest of his life. He lived to be into his 90s and uh, died in uh, 2018. His, uh, he died at home in Palm Harbor, Florida, and is buried there. So I'm proud to do this tribute to John Halada and his life is replicated a hundred times over, and I love hearing from you guys. Tell me about your grandpa and your fathers, uh, your great uncle, people who fought, the greatest generation, people who fought in World War II, came back, uh, lived ordinary lives, but did extraordinary things. Thanks for watching, and make sure you check out our playlist, because as you know, there's other stories for you to watch.